Good morning, everyone. My name is Mitchell. The title of my presentation is called Text Adept Behind the Scenes, where we're going to be taking a look underneath the hood of the Text Adept text editor to see just how it uses Lua, from its innovative syntax highlighting engine to its embedded scripting environment. Now, before I get started, let me give you a little background on myself. I got my bachelor's degree in aerospace engineering in 2010, but I've been working in software ever since. And um, I've been working with Lua since 2006. I started Text Adept in 2007, and I just love working with open source software. I currently maintain four active projects. I contribute to a handful of others. So the outline of my presentation is as follows. First, I'm going to give you a brief introduction to Text Adept, why it exists, why it uses Lua. And I'm going to talk to you about some of the, the problems that I encountered in, tech, in text editor design that Lua solves. And this includes syntax highlighting, uh, code completion. Now, when I say code completion, I don't mean uh, word completion. I mean actual syntactic code completion. This is the kind of completions that you would get in an integrated development environment. And then I'm going to talk about how to script the user interface using Lua. In particular, I'm going to talk about the external editing component that TextAdept uses. And then after all this, I'll be happy to take any questions you may have. So why does TextAdept exist? Well, some of you may be familiar with the SciTe or Skite text editor and its Lua integration. I was actually really happy with it for a while, but I outgrew it. I wanted something more powerful, something that Lua could control completely. And so I didn't start TextAdept to solve a problem or fill a void in the text editor market. I just did it for myself, and it happened to evolve into something that was useful to other people. So why did I choose Lua? Well, I was already familiar with Lua uh, through SciTe, and I realized its, its power and its elegance. And after doing some more research, I concluded that Lua was just the perfect fit for a small and extensible text editor, and all other, all other languages were complex or too big to embed, stuff like that. Now, I encountered a lot of very interesting problems in text editor design, uh, but I'd like to share three of those with you. And again, that's syntax highlighting, code completion, and UI scripting. So syntax highlighting. We're all familiar with it. It's the stuff that highlights our code, makes it easier to read, makes it easier to spot errors when we write it. But how exactly do editors do syntax highlighting? Well, syntax highlighting is really just a form of pattern matching. So some editors use regular expressions. They make multiple passes through the text. They mark their matches, and they highlight those matches appropriately. Other editors use character iteration, which requires just a single pass, but it's much more complex due to its granularity. It's kind of like a giant state machine. But TextAdept uses LPEG. When Roberto first announced the LPEG pattern matching library in 2006, I had an idea that it could be used for syntax highlighting. But it wasn't until a post to the Lua mailing list in 2007 by Peter Odding that I realized that it could actually be done. <coughs> so full disclosure here, I am by no means an expert on the semantics of programming language design, so the terminology that I'm about to use could be incorrect. It may not match with LPEG's terminology, but this is what I think that I've learned over the years. So in order to understand syntax highlighting, we need to figure out what exactly are we highlighting? Well, we can break down programming languages into some of their most basic components, called, which I'll call tokens. And these tokens are things like white space, comments, and strings. Now, we can combine tokens into what I'll call rules that make up a language's grammar. So on the right-hand side, you'll see an example of, or a snippet, rather, from a Lua syntax highlighter, which is called the Lexer. Now, you can see at the top that I've defined a white space token to be any number of white space characters. Now, don't worry about that L variable. It's just a Lexer module framework that I wrote to help facilitate the writing of Lexers. You can also see that I've defined tokens for comments and strings, using some ordered choices to differentiate between different types of comments and different types of strings. Now, where it really gets interesting is in this rules table. This rules table is an ordered list of rules that can make up the Lua grammar. So the Lua grammar tries to match white space first, followed by keywords, functions, etc and then strings and comments, and finally numbers, labels, and operators. So all of this together produces syntax highlighting for Lua, but how? So behind the scenes, all I'm really doing is I'm loading this lexer, I'm building its grammar from its rules table, I'm calling lpeg.match on the output, or sorry, given input text, and then using the output text, I'm actually doing the highlighting. So on the right-hand side, you can see an example of the matcher in the output in action. 
So given this snippet of uh, Lua input text and using the Lua grammar, the lpeg.match function returns a table of tokens followed by the positions in the text that the tokens match up to. So you can see that the first 10 characters in that input text should be highlighted as a comment, the next character as white space, the next five characters as a keyword, and so on. Now, I actually have some C code that does the physical highlighting, but it is Lua that tells the highlighter what exactly to highlight. Now, the cool thing about using LPEG is that it's very easy to embed lexers within one another. For example, embedding CSS into HTML. All the parent lexer has to do is load the child, or vice versa, the child can load the parent. And then you create start and end rules that match the embedded child, and then call one single embedding function. So on the right, I'm embedding Lua into HTML. So within the HTML lexer at the bottom, I just load the Lua lexer, I create some start and end rules that look a lot like PHP tags, and then I call a single embed lexer function. Now, I could have done the opposite. I could have loaded the HTML lexer from within the Lua lexer in order to start the embedding process. And some things are a little different, but ultimately I would wind up with the exact same thing. So these are interchangeable. Now behind the scenes, how does embed lexer work? Well, all it really is doing is it's taking the parent rules and it's combining it with the child rules, as long as the, those child rules are in between start and end rules. It's combining all of this into one giant grammar. And that grammar tries to match the start rule first, falling, falling back on the parent rule. And then this process repeats until a start rule is encountered. And then as long as an end rule isn't encountered, the child rules match. So this may sound pretty complex, but when you think about it, it makes sense. It's quite simple, and it works very well. So I mentioned a Lexer module framework a few slides back. Uh, I just want to make the point that I'm using LPEG to match other common language syntax patterns. For example, delimited ranges with escape, balanced, and forbidden characters. So this first, <laughs> this first example uh, will return a pattern that matches balanced parentheses while taking into account forward slash escape characters, as long as this entire range uh, is on one single line. So new line characters are forbidden. You can also match nested pairs. For example, the D programming language uses this kind of notation for its comment delimiters. That true Boolean at the end simply indicates the pattern will match even if the end delimiter does not exist. So that unfinished comments will still highlight as comments as opposed to plain text or something else completely. The beginnings of lines can also be matched. This is particularly useful for C preprocessor directives, which need to start at the beginnings of lines. And then finally, you can match words in a list using a single function as opposed to a bunch of ordered choice patterns. Now, I actually ran into this problem early in Lexer development where I used ordered choice patterns to match keywords for languages. So in CSS, for example, there are a ton of keywords. You know, there's attribute names, there's values, there's color names. And similarly, in HTML, there's a ton of element names and attribute names. And using a bunch of ordered choices here, when I actually embedded CSS into HTML, I ran into the maximum limit of LPEG patterns, uh, which was 32,700 and something elements. It was ridiculous. But when I replaced all of those ordered choices with a word match function, or a number of word match functions, the problem went away completely. And one of the benefits to using the word match function is you can match uh, characters, or sorry, match words case sensitively or in case insensitively. And this doesn't make much sense for using order choice. So let's move on to code completion. Again, we're talking about syntactic code completion and not word completion. So how do editors do syntactic code completion? Well, some of them use a static tags list, like the output generated from C tags. The downside to this is it's, well, it's static and you need to constantly regenerate this list, particularly for actively developed code. And then some editors use what's called introspection, which is running or executing the code up until the point of completion, and then asking the interpreter what completions are available. So while this is one of the most accurate forms of code completion, it really only applies to interpreted languages, and it has the potentially undesirable effect of executing live code. Now, there are other language, or sorry, other editors that actually parse the language, such as a, a compiler or an interpreter would, and um, maybe use an abstract syntax tree, or AST, to provide the list of completions. 
Now I think that languages that use the Java virtual machine, or at least that run on the Java virtual machine, uh, they can load their code without executing it and then take advantage of the JVMs, ASTs to provide completions. Uh, the obvious downside here is that the language needs to run on the JVM um, or you need a specialized parser to provide the, the output that you desire. And then of course there are hybrid approaches that include the above or something else that I, I have chosen not to present here. TextAdept itself uses a hybrid approach and even though it's simple and flexible, it also has its share of downsides. So the hybrid approach that TextAdept uses is a C tags-ish static stuff uh, with dynamic type and class inference using pattern matching. Now if you look at AdeptSense is data structure, the basic data structure, all it consists of is a set of function and field completions inside classes. Now I use the term class here, but I don't mean it in the full sense of the word. A class is just simply a container that holds functions and fields. So in Lua, for example, uh, tables and modules would be considered classes in this context. And similarly, functions and fields are simply just entities that can be held within a class. In reality, they can be constants or macros or whatever you want, it doesn't really matter. So let's take a look behind the scenes at a Lua depth sense. So I used the word C tags ish earlier because C tags doesn't have very good support for Lua. So I wrote a tool that piggybacks off of Lua doc to generate a set of C tags like tags. And AdeptSense reads these kinds of tags files. Now it could be the output from C tags or it could be something that looks like C tags. And AdeptSense reads this in order to get its list of classes, function, and fields. So you can see on the right uh, that the string class, class again, uh, has the functions and has the functions that you would normally expect as well as the table class and any other classes that are here. So this will give you the, the completions that you would expect when you do table or string dot or table dot. But what about more complex things? What about if I had a variable foo that had a string and I did foo colon and I wanted to do like foo colon len to get the length of the string? Does AdeptSense do these sorts of completions? And the answer is yes in some certain contexts. So AdeptSense can infer the type or class of an object using pattern matching. So for example, it can recognize when it's inside a class declaration and it's completing a self type of keyword for the languages that support such things. It can also infer the type of an object through its type declaration in a statically typed language such as Java or C. And then it can infer its type from a type assignment in a dynamically typed language such as Lua. So in, in this last example here, the foo variable would be recognized as a string and then when you do foo colon, it will give you the list of string completions that you expect, including the len function. So behind the scenes, all AdeptSense is really doing for this type inference is it's searching backwards, trying to match patterns. Now this obviously has some false positives. For example, it could incorrectly infer the type of a global variable as the type of a local variable of the same name in a previously defined function. Also, it has no way of inferring the type from the return value of a function. However, despite these shortcomings, for myself at least, this method works quite well. I haven't had any real major problems with it. I've written adept senses for C, for Lua, CSS, HTML, Java, PHP, Python, Ruby. For all these languages, I haven't had any major issues. One of the cool things about adept sense is that you can subclass its methods. So, so AdeptSense by itself is just a collection of functions that apply to a broad range of languages in the broadest sense possible. So some languages will need more fine-tuned AdeptSenses to match their types of syntax. So in Ruby, for example, everything is an object, including numbers. By default, AdeptSense cannot recognize numbers as symbols. So I was able to subclass some of AdeptSense methods for Ruby in order to recognize numbers as symbols and provide a list of completions, either if it's an integer or a float class. And similarly, I was able to recognize array and hash literals by themselves as opposed to being assigned through an intermediate variable. So for example, if I had foo equals array one, two, three, foo dot whatever to get the set of completions, I could instead do array one, two, three dot and get that same set of completions. Okay, so by now you've seen that a good chunk of TextAdept is written in Lua. Well, actually most of TextAdept is written in Lua. 
So where exactly does the C come in? Well, the C is sort of the Lua glue uh, to interact with the user interface. So TextAdept is written with the GTK or NCURSES libraries for its UI, and those are written with C. So using a combination of meta tables and callback methods, UI elements such as text boxes can be read or written into. You can create menus using Lua tables. You can uh, recognize key press events, pass them off to Lua to be interpreted as editor commands, and so on. But rather than focusing on these types of interactions, what I'd like to talk to you about in particular is how TextAdept interfaces with its external scripting, or sorry, with its external editing component. So TextAdept uses the Scintilla external editing component. It's a C++ library that has a very Lua-friendly API. And this API consists of just a series of messages with two parameters each. So this first message, for an example, is how to insert text at a particular position in what's called the buffer. And you can see that the Lua equivalent is actually quite similar. It even uses the object-oriented notation that we're familiar with. Now in the second example, this is a message for getting the character at a particular position in the buffer. Now we can think of buffers as just tables of characters, so when we want to get the position at a particular, or sorry, when we want to get the character at a particular position in the buffer, it's sort of like indexing a table. And so the Lua equivalent is actually quite similar. Notice, however, that we do have the unfortunate zero-based notation in this case instead of the familiar one-based notation. This is simply because Scintilla is a C++ library, and also it's non-trivial to differentiate between integer positions versus regular integers for passing it to these parameters. Now the last example is just setting the end-of-line mode for a buffer. So we would expect that these buffer objects have parameters, and one of those parameters is associated with the end-of-line mode that we can set. And as you can expect, this is going to be the Lua equivalent. We have an ELL mode parameter that we can get and set. So how exactly do we do this translation between C++ and Lua? Well, behind the scenes, each buffer object has index and new index meta tables. And since every scintilla message has an ID number associated with it, we can represent different scintilla uh, functions and different scintilla properties in the following format. So functions will have an ID number, they'll have a return type, and they'll have two parameter types. And scintilla properties have a getter function ID, a setter function ID, a return type, and then an optional parameter type. So how do we get a function, say that insert text function from the previous slide, how do we get that from the buffer object? Well, it's actually pretty simple. All we do is inside the index meta method, we do a lookup, and we return a callable closure, using er, a callable closure that contains this function format. So that when the closure is called, we know what message to call, and we can pass that message uh, the parameters that were passed to the closure, doing any sort of type checking because we also know the types of those parameters. Now, getting and setting buffer properties is a little more difficult. Uh, recall the, the notation that we used in the previous slide. And uh, if the optional parameter type does not exist, then it's what's called a simple property. It's like buffer.eol mode. We can just get it or set it, no problem. However, if the optional parameter type does exist, then it's what's called an, an indexable property. And so I'll return an empty table that contains index and new index meta methods, such that when that table is indexed with a number, say buffer.careAt index of zero, we get the desired effect. So you can get or set the character at a particular position. Now, regardless of whether or not we're using simple properties or indexable properties, if the index meta method is called, ultimately we're going to be using the getter function ID to call the scintilla message to return the appropriate value. And likewise, if the new index meta method is called, ultimately we're going to be using the setter function ID in order to set, in order to call scintilla to set the appropriate value. So using these two methods for functions and properties, we end up scripting the entire scintilla API so now Lua can insert text, it can move the caret position, it can scroll the window up and down, it can do anything that Scintilla can do. So this provides a very, very high level of scripting for the editor component. 
So in conclusion, I've presented to you some of the problems in text editor design that Lua solves and solves quite well. Um, TextAdept uses LPEG to highlight syntax. It uses Lua as a basis for a simple and flexible code completion engine. And it uses a Lua and C interface to completely script its user interface. So I could go on and on about how instrumental Lua has been to TextAdept's development, but I hope that this presentation gave you a pretty good idea of just how extensible it is. So at this point, I would like to thank you for your time. I'd like to thank VeriSign for sponsoring this year's workshop. I'd like to thank Roberto, Luis, and the entire Lua team for such a wonderful language. At this point, I'll be happy to answer any questions you have. Thank you very much.